You're listening to the Paul Higgins Show, the place for ambitious tech consultants scaling to live better after 18 years as a global leader and having a successful tech consulting exit. I'm sharing what's working now to transform emerging tech consultants worldwide into trusted consultants that attract the best clients and deliver measurable results. When you're ready to level up your clarity, results and freedom, Begin with the free strategic profits blueprint available at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash blueprint. Imagine this, a client wants a quick fix on a sales CRM and you see the dollar signs and you get tempted to move fast, but beware, be very aware. Hello, this is Paul Higgins and welcome to episode 528 of the Paul Higgins show. In this podcast, Ben covers the four minds to, uh, to divert disaster by taking that quick fix. And he talks a lot about adaptive change and how that can help you to solve bigger problems than just that quick fix of a sales CRM or any other implementation of software is changing the way organizations succeed. He's a consultant, a coach, and helps leaders navigate uncertainty, streamline operations, unlock opportunities for growth. Ben uses data-driven insights to develop measurable strategies that propel organizations forward. His ability to spot what matters most and bridge ideas with implementation leads to truly remarkable results. What I'll do now is hand you over to Ben Straup, from VelocityStrategySolutions.com. Great to have you here, Ben. Thank you. It's good to be here. So excited to have you here because I am a bit of a preacher. I get on my soapbox often and say to people, look, you're not a Salesforce partner, a NetSuite partner, HubSpot. You know, you're a, a strategist and what you're doing is actually giving people outcomes, you're giving people holes and not drills. The technology just supports it. And when I first came across your website, I watched your video, I'm like, yes, yeah, Ben is more than preaching this. He is living this. And uh, that's why I wanted to get you on to, to talk about that. But why don't we kick off with who your ideal client is and what problems you'd love to solve for them? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. We typically work with organizations somewhere in the 25 million to 150 million category. We almost always first engage with the C-suite. So this is the individual or group of individuals who can see across the organization. They're synthesizing details. They're seeing at a macro level what can happen and what is happening. And, uh, they also have the greatest access to decision-making authority and budget to make systemic changes in the organization. They have attempted to solve a problem internally and have been unsuccessful at doing it. And they are often also experiencing what I call or what we call a revenue event. So something is up, something is flat, or something is declining. And that is creating the pressure to search for someone on the um, outside. And when we meet people, they typically try to put us into one of two categories. Are we a consultant? In other words, somebody who can come in and come up with a bunch of great ideas that sound awesome, supported with evidence that they can't implement on or can't implement? Or are we an agency and we got a list of 10 or 12 things that we do really well at scale and they're just trying to pick which one is closest to what they think the solution is? And what we like to say is we're the third option. We're really true uh, a partner when it comes to strategic execution. So we like to sit between the internal and external stakeholders and ensure that the team uh, stays aligned, simplifies technology, eliminates complexity, drives revenue, and gets across the finish line, most importantly, on time and on budget. Yeah, look, it's great. And I wish I had have known you back 2010. I know I'm going back a while here, but worked in corporate, but I worked within a subdivision. And, you know, let's say it was basically five times the revenue that you mentioned in your top end, but it had problems that you you solve regularly. And, and back then, digital was just coming on the scene. And, you know, I was on the exec team and I'm I'm like, we actually need a digital person sitting on the exec team, right? Like we need not an IT person that's doing the systems. Like this is going to completely change every facet of the business. And it's very similar to something we all hear at the moment, which is AI, right? And, you know, we had the, the, the transformation company come in and, you know, they were just all in the strategy bucket, right? That's it. And they didn't get the connection of the digital. They didn't have the digital expertise and the technology to say, how are we going to expedite? How are we going to run it through? 
that's how we're going to get the real gains here. And, and I sounded like a lone wolf. I'm like in the exact team and behind the scenes talking to the CEO saying, you know, this is the way the future is going to be. This is what we got to do. We can be part of And it's just fell on deaf ears too hard. So now it's brilliant to go full circle talk and uh, see it in practice. So I know you talk about uh, the four minds. Uh, it's one of your key things and you, you know, we'll have the links to, to Ben's website in the show notes so you can go and see it yourself. There's a great video and, and the way that he articulates it, but about these four minds and how does it relate to the problems that you solve that you just articulated? Absolutely. So we think today's the, the challenge of today is that we have operated largely in leadership circles uh, by practicing kind of the core tenets of industrial management, uh, which is predicated on you know distribution of labor and division of labor. Everybody has their role. And as long as everybody executes on their role, it comes together. That's fine in a known world. And in that known world, that's where we discovered Lean Six Sigma, right? You know, I'm going to do it a number of times to eliminate all risk and all potential variants. And I'm going to get it down to where it's very predictable and reliable. But uh, in today's world, we are disconnected from uh, reliable and, and consistent of any kind of patterns. Anything that existed pre-COVID, we're now far enough into the impact um, of the pandemic that were, you know, that we can't trust the, the, the assumptions that made those patterns true before are true now. And we don't yet have enough data to say this is what a baseline is going to be, which means we have to shift our confidence from looking at things as we have experienced them in the past to looking at things from multiple perspectives, almost a 360 degree view around the outcome that we're trying to create. I mean, we literally are we are searching for a solution that does not presently exist. And so in order to do that, my theory of the four minds is that you have to have four particular ways of thinking that surround every challenge or outcome in order to produce a solution or a possibility that has a chance of creating systemic change. And those four minds are strategy, operations, technology, and data. You know, in the industrial management world, the strategy person would come and they would say, okay, here's my big idea. And then they would look to the operations person and they would say, make it true. They would look to the technology person and they would say, what technology do we need? And they would look to the data person and say, what data do we have available in order to support that? And everyone would snap to their previous experience and their past success. But nice. if we're trying to go somewhere we've never been, if we're trying to create a new reality that, hasn't, that doesn't yet exist, we actually have to work together, which means we have to understand enough of each other's disciplines to recognize that to solve a data problem, we have to understand the other three parts of that. To solve a technology, to understand the other three minds that are part of that. And so this is really what we're seeing exhibited when we hear a lot about collaborative interdependent teams that are organized around shared outcomes and not particular functional areas or metrics. And I think that is what's most important about that is that it elevates the role of we in the transformation process. And it really moves us past the idea that any single individual has an insight that we're waiting to come down off the mountain with some stone tablets to tell us how to move forward. Is there, I mentioned it briefly, but let's call the elephant in the room. It's in every conversation these days is the AI piece. So does the AI piece sit under the technology piece? And if it does, you know, how much is that currently impacting the, the, the four minds? I think what's been interesting, and we've seen this really since what we used to call ASP back in the day, which is now called the cloud, is we moved toward that type of infrastructure. And then you saw your bring your own device. And then you saw SaaS-based business models that came into play. We really have started, you know, we've really been kind of chipping away at the idea that IT is this functional area that sits separate from everything else. And we've started to see what I think is that where technology needs to be embedded inside the organization, much like we see business analysts. You know, business analysts might all roll up functionally under operations or business intelligence, but they are sitting side by side with the business line leaders and the directors and the vice presidents in order to make sure that there's a completeness of understanding of what's happening, what could happen, and what is likely to happen in any moment in time. And so when we get to the AI conversation, what's driving adoption is not technology. 
what's driving adoption is that the business leader is finding value. Now, mind you, AI today, as we truly understand it, is what I call simulated automation. There is a lot of effort by a very few number of people to make it look magical, but we are far from truly uncovering what's really possible with artificial intelligence. And I think the next five years, my prediction is that every organization is going to have to reconcile their system architecture and their data flow and their business processes in order to centralize and integrate and simplify so that there is the possibility that as the complexity of technology comes down and it becomes more accessible commercial market that the organization could actually take advantage of it. So we are just at the beginning of it. But what's interesting is the idea that where solutions like Grammarly or ChatGPT or Copilot are finding its kind of drive toward adoption is from the business leader creating value, trying to solve a business outcome, not from the technology person uh, championing it going from person to person across the organization. And I think that is a remarkable shift, but it is the natural progression of what we've been seeing over the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. And look, you know, four minds, the only thing that has mind is a person, right? So people are imperative in this in this change. So I think you said that 87% of transformations, digital transformations fail. And, you know, often that's due to the people, not the, the technology, right? And we've all all heard that. You as a tech consultant have, have, have heard that all the time. So tell us a, a little bit about your current thinking in your your current view on the the, the people side of it, the, the, the people change side of whole transformation. Absolutely. So we, we tend to, when we move through digital transformation, there's really two elements. There's technical elements. And I don't mean technical as far as technology. There's technical elements as in there's a defined problem and solution. It's known. And then there's adaptive elements to it. In other words, we're trying to define the problem, design the solution, test the solution, implement the solution. And I think where we often fail and where HBR gets the basis of his research to tell us uh, that 87% of DT initiatives fail is because we spend more time on the technical and we spend less time on the adaptive. And we, that's a skill set that we don't champion in business school that is supposed to be learned and just is supposed to have been modeled for you. And that's not at all how leaders have been kind of groomed. You know, if you can imagine you had the dominance of engineering coming out of the World War II generation. And then after Sarbanes-Oxley, you had the invasion, as I did like to describe it, of the professional worry warts, the accountants and the attorneys into the C-suite. We have lived through a season of perfection and then risk mitigation. And here we are thrust into a period of time where we are creating and innovating and true, truly being entrepreneurial, and it is shaking everyone to its bones. And so we have to equip people, not just with knowledge, but we have to equip people with what it feels like, the, the skills and the tools necessary in order to love the process, not the destination. And I really, where I have seen success and failure, where I have experienced success and failure is when I have believed that uh, everything is a technical or a majority a technical a challenge and not an adaptive challenge. And when that ratio isn't right, the, pro, the process and the project becomes lopsided. And then eventually uh, you, lose, uh, you lose people. You lose people and it becomes disengaged. You, know, dis you experience disengagement you experience drift and then all of a sudden everyone's got other things to do and they've deemed it dead on arrival and you haven't even really had a chance to start. I just think we need a new expanded tool set for today because digital is not going anywhere, but digital is not a tool. Digital is a way of thinking about the customer experience and digital is a way of operating that creates accountability and transparency and visibility across how an organization operates so that you can identify and make sure that what we say we're going to do for the customer, we're actually delivering on, and we can pinpoint that friction and that flow and resolve it. Yeah. And you talked about adaptive tools or skills. You know, what are they? What can you, you're listening to Ben here and Ben Strop, episode 528, this sort of thing, look, 
Ben, I get it. Like I've, I've heard it. I'm, I'm trying to get there. You know, how do I go and develop those things? Like for many of us, you know, we, we went to university a long, long time ago. We haven't, haven't done any post-grad. Some of us have done an MBA, not many, you know, but you know, how do we, how do we update our hardware for the end software for this adaptive component? I think there's three characteristics that are true of adaptive leaders. One is there's enough humility that they realize that their past success is not enough to have confidence of future success. And that humility leads to curiosity and just flat out being curious about what they don't know um, and what they should know and what do other people know. And I think that, that you have to have a little bit of humility to be open to that. And then I think there's this general sense that of experimentation, the freedom that comes in that. And I'm not talking about reckless experiment. There's structured experimentation where you might fail, but you fail in service of some future success or more importantly, learning. And that's what we talk a lot about uh, in our work at Velocity is how do we create a culture of learning where we have continuous feedback loops? So I think those are three characteristics, but I think some of the other tools that are really important is communication, written communication. Do we all agree that the problem is the problem? Do we all agree that the cause of the problem is the cause of the problem? Do we all agree that the success is what, it is what success is? We call that decision support and stakeholder alignment. And I'm telling you, when you get leadership team, leadership folks on leadership team in a room, it's like herding tigers, I'm trying to get them all to be on the same page and, and see the world in the same eyes. I mean, they are vigorously defending their perspective on things. Once you get through that, you have to have some kind of consensus around where are we and where are we going? Otherwise, you don't have any waypoints in order to organize around. I think, you know, the second part of adaptive leadership is you have to have the time to understand where you're deficient um, that would inhibit you of taking action. So you have to be willing to build in the capacity inside your organization to make it true, not just once, but to sustain it. And then you have to be able to do the planning in order to understand the cost of success. I have a mentor of mine that used to work for the Department of Justice, and he built prisons. And half of his business for 30 years came from sheriffs who walked in uh, on when they were supposed to close on the new prison and start the process of moving and realized they couldn't move in. How do you get there without, you know, how do you get to that point? You haven't taken the time to do the planning process. And the planning process means that I have to listen to every single stakeholder and make sure I heard them and make sure they're incorporated into the solution. It means that I have to go back from time to time and do that. The other part that's really key here is not just communication and clarity, but conflict resolution. We have often trained leaders to mitigate conflict by either avoiding it because of personality differences or by kind of deferring to rank within the organization. And I think in order for us to have a truly an interdependent team, there has to be a shared sense of responsibility and accountability, that agile principle of self-organizing team. There are certainly functional roles that people play within organizations when we are surrounding an outcome that we're trying to do each person on that, no matter of their position, should be willing to listen to the other person. But the other part of conflict resolution is the other person may not communicate or work in the same way that I do. And I got to tell you, it took me far too long to realize that people in the world don't think like I do, process information like I do, or communicate like I do. I'm an external processor. That's not going to surprise anybody. But guess what external processing does? It doesn't leave any room for people who process internally. Yes. And some of the best ideas come from the people who are the quietest in the room. We have to reinvigorate a focus on communication. We have to reinvigorate a focus on clarity and understanding the cost of success. We have to reinvigorate around conflict resolution. And then I think we have to reinvigorate around the role of documentation. Yes. Um, and this is something that I think is really important because it creates institutional memory. How many times somebody leaves an organization and then we realize we don't know what they knew. And when we investigate, we realize that what they knew was handed from the person from them and from before them and before them. And so we're so far removed from the why we can't even deconstruct or reconstruct. But that institutional documentation says, 
given the information and the scenario that we are in today, this is why we made this decision. And being able to examine, inspect, and then either deviate or affirm that position going forward creates continuity. And that's a really, really important piece. And when you look back, it creates a, a very much of a, a path that you followed that feels like you're all over the place and upside down, but it's actually going to be much straighter than, than what you think. I, I think that that adaptive leadership and may, maybe the, the last part of that characteristic there would be problem solving. And problem solving, not to say we're going to eliminate all risk, but problem solving in the midst of risk and recognizing that the the solution is as good as the information we have today and pending new information, am I flexible enough in order to be able to adapt when new information is available? Yeah, Those are some of the things I think would be really important. Yeah, look, and, and I think it's, um, you know, often what I see is that, like you said, you know, you look through your window to the world, you know, differently to others, but I often see that a lot of tech consultants are so enamored with their the, the product, the technology that they do struggle to see through the window of the, the owner. And, you know, the owner is looking at it differently. So I know for a quick example, it is a little bit similar to say HubSpot, Salesforce, whatever there's a, typically there's a, you know, there's a franchise or franchisee. And so for us, it was the, when I worked in corporate, it was the Coke company versus the bottlers. And what I did was actually went for two weeks and worked in the role of the, the company. I so went on the other side, so to speak, and really truly understood it. And I think for a lot of you that are the technologist and you grew up as a technologist, et cetera, sometimes it's hard to see it from the window of the business owner because you haven't actually walked in their shoes. So I think it's, you know, yes. really important to to do that as much as you can. So go in a and immerse yourself into the the business. And it's harder these days because we are mainly virtual. You know, in the old days, it was easy because you could sit in someone's office, et cetera. So now it's a little bit harder to do it. But, you know, there are recordings. There's different tools now where you can try to get more into the mind of the business owner and more of the culture of the business to then form your view, you know. So you're getting outside of your window, which is on, on the technologist only. And I think, you know, what I understand you, you do that really well and, you know, would employ people to do that more. So sometimes you've got to go slow at the start to go fast later. Whereas what we want to do often is go fast straight away. The question relating to this in the, in the business owner or the CEO, which is, you know, you've got to often get it from well, top down. I think it's got to be led from the, from the leader, right? You know, Absolutely. how do you in a discovery call make sure that they are really up to the challenge, right? Cause people sometimes say they want this, but you get a month in, two months in, and you realize that, that they're not. So how do you qualify that this is the right client to go on this transformational change? Well, what we look for is have they done the work necessary to enter the engagement at the point in which they would like us to enter? So for instance, if somebody comes and says, I need a new CRM, my first question is, let's put that on the parking lot right now and let's back up. What are you trying to achieve as a organization that you can't achieve today? How did you and what do you think are the mitigating realities to that? And try to just probe around that. If they've done the work, they have kind of a project charter, if you will, that lists out uh, root cause, that lists out you know business uh, desired business outcomes, the problems they're trying to solve. And if there's clarity there, then I move to the next level and say, have they really understood the requirements to arrive at that solution? Or are they simply saying that I've seen the most, I've heard the most about this name, I've got a friend that's used it and it solved all of their problems because you know we all have we all have lived long enough to know that it's not a single piece of technology that's just going to instantaneously we're going to turn it on and suddenly it's going to solve all of our problems it's actually going to further compound the problems especially I see this a lot inside organizations where there are two, three, four, five CRMs operating inside the same architecture. And it's nonsense, but it's because every person believed that that solution was going to solve their problem. And then once they compounded the problem, they didn't know how to get, get it back in its box. <laughs> uh, they, they just had that problem they had to deal with. If we don't have a requirements document, then I can't commit myself or any of my team to lead them through any type of implementation initiative. If somebody, you know, if, if they've done the work though, however, we can get up to speed with them 
maybe challenge or validate uh, with that. And then we'll be ready to truly understand what it looks like to, uh, you know, to design an implementation and adoption plan. And for us, adoption is really the threshold, the, the ultimate threshold of success, because uh, adoption tells us that the business user is using it and is benefiting from it and has a greater sense of confidence that they're going to be able to deliver on the things that are most important to them and how they're graded than they did prior to the transformation itself. A lot of people just stop with implementation, but I think that next that next year, the sixth year, if you will, of adoption is should be that threshold of success. And so if someone hasn't done that work, that's a pretty good indication that adoption is not important. If someone hasn't done the work, then there's a pretty good sign that we're not going to be successful in that implementation. And doing the work and having executive buy-in are two of the things that will either accelerate a project or kill a project in, in the midst of it. And gosh, I've been, I started managing implementations 20 years ago on the AS400 and uh, you know around payroll HR, right? Two of the highly most regulated areas of any business. The anxiety was high when we were moving from one to the next. And I had some really great mentors and, and teachers along the line that really taught me what it meant to do the work and take the time necessary to investigate because it's a lot easier to inspect and evaluate before you know you're live and, and in motion but if the times that the organization the the company were clear on you know on all of the objectives and what was necessary those are the implementations that resulted in the lasting customers the times where there was lack of clarity or a rush, to onboard, those are the times that became the most rocky. And those, you know, typically those client, uh, you know, length of stay was truncated because of that process. Yeah, it's so true. And I think, you know, often it's the case if someone is too eager. Yeah. And and the other one I often looked for with, you know, more sizable projects was, is someone, an internal stakeholder in the business actually getting pulled out of their day-to-day job to actually help you as a as a consulting team to come in and fix the problem. Like if, if, because, you know, we, I suppose we had the luxury back in Coca-Cola because we had good profit margins that we could do this, but we would, we would do that. We would put someone on a project and say, that's, that's you're going to do rather than have it as an addition to everyone's job, which we all know that they just don't have the capacity to do that. So that was always a telling sign for me. If I didn't see that within the business and that level of commitment, that there's a very senior person that's dedicated to the success of this, to champion it, to be the internal key stakeholder. And this, that was always a a really a large red flag for me. But look, we could talk about this, Ben, forever. I know that people can go and find out more about you at Ben Strop, which is S T R O U P dot com. So that's your where you do your speak. And we'll also give all the the URLs at the end of this for where they can find you on your company site, etc. But what we're going to do now is go to the rapid fire. Imagine stepping into a sales call and your potential client already knows and understands your expertise and is eager to engage with you. It sounds like a dream scenario, but with the right tool, it's entirely achievable. Introducing Teller.TV, T-E-L-L-A, your ultimate solution for personalized pre-sales videos. Teller TV empowers you to craft impactful video messages that resonate with your potential clients before you connect with them. One of the standout features of Teller is its seamless editing capabilities and automatic captioning, saving you time and ensuring your message is clear and accessible to all viewers. Ready to revolutionize your pre-sales process? Teller.tv today by visiting our resource page at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash resources and clicking on Teller. Elevate your sales game with Teller because your success starts before the call even begins. I'm going to ask you four questions. You need to give me four rapid responses. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. All right, let's do this. So the first one, what are some of the daily habits that help you scale velocity strategy solutions? Each week, I will plan out, I'll look across all the projects, and I'll make sure I have awareness of where we are in orientation to those milestones, and I'll actually decide what has to happen that week in order to move the entire organization forward. And then I will break down those steps into what are the things that are needed for me in order to enable other people on the team in order to be successful, and I'll schedule those. That way, I know every single, I'm no more than 24 hours from being on, off, or sideways 
from where I need to be in order to ensure that the organization continues to move forward. And I think that daily habit of weekly habit of deciding what needs to happen throughout the week and then the daily habit of reconciling that is the single most important thing that I do to give me confidence because life comes at you and it comes at you hard. And it's not always the business that comes at you. If you at least have your waypoints, if I got these one, two or three things done, I may have disappointed myself in some other areas, but if I got those two, three things done, then I'm not holding anything else up. Brilliant. The next one is where do you got to learn more about Scarlet? I absolutely am a, a, like a, a, an unbelievable consumer of information. I usually tell people, you can't give me too much information. Well, I subscribe to anywhere from 55 to 60 podcasts, listen to them all at two times speed. Most of the time while I'm running and driving, trying to fully maximize the utilization of that, of that time in order to feed the mind. I re- frequently find you know articles and subscribe to different sources that I've really curated either through RSS or email. And then I'll, I'll use different tools in order to read through those. If I find one that I want to keep, then I have a whole system of how I organize. So I'm basically building an entire library, which hopefully one day I'll turn into my own individual large language model that I'll be able to uh, pull from. And the other thing is I like to spend time with people who are further along than I do. And that has been a key characteristic from the beginning, got some great advice early on, and I've continued to do that. And so I seek out opportunities with individuals, even if they're not in the same lane, but they're definitely more successful. They're definitely more mature in their uh, their professional life than I am. And I just, occasionally those turn into wonderful relationships, but just meeting those folks, surrounding yourself, being around people who have who have seen how what success looks like and they know the, the bitterness of failure and they know the, the sweetness of victory. Um, it really does help challenge and refine and focus you on what are the things that really matter. Right, and, and the next one is, what's one wish we could grant the double? I'd really prefer not not to have to sleep. There's a, <laughs> what's hard, I think, especially in this kind of, I'll call it this new world, is that our, our kind of boundaries are different. So when everyone had a generally start, agreed upon start time and end time, we kind of knew when work would happen and when it wouldn't happen. And for me, I really like quietness of the morning. I'll get up very early, hours before. And so by the time I'm in my first meeting, I've probably invested four hours. But I find that by the time I get to the end of the day, 12 hours later, it's a uh, 12, 15 hours. It's it's a slog. It would be absolutely fantastic. And I know there's all kinds of biological reasons why that would be a terrible idea. But I, I just, I love what I do. I love the people that I work with. I can't get enough of it. And I want to be the sharpest. I want to be ready for when those challenges come. Um, and I want to be equipped to, you know, challenge, validate, inject a new idea. And so it's important to me to be uh, in, in tip top and shape. And sometimes that's both my mind and my body. And, uh, and sometimes I just run out of time in the day. I hear you. And the last one is, uh, what do you know now that you wish you had known earlier? I think what's important to me is you can miss an outcome, but win the team and you'll have a chance to stand up and achieve another outcome together. But if you achieve the outcome and lose the team, they may not sign back up for that next outcome. The most important thing that I have learned, and I, gosh, if if you had known me in that period of time, I'd have to apologize. I mean, I was such a hard driver of just trying, nothing mattered but getting that outcome. And I realized that if you really wanna do something significant inside an organization, if you really wanna lead change, you gotta win the people over. And the most important thing that you can do is make sure that no one suffers in silence, everyone has a voice, and that no one gets left behind. And you're going to go farther faster with that method than always just simply striving for the outcome at the expense of everyone and just thinking that we'll just find somebody else if they just want to quit uh, in the process. And so I've definitely made some mistakes in that area, and but I'm, I'm on the road to redemption and rehabilitation. How about that? Yeah, brilliant. Well, uh, you can find more about Ben, as I said, is Ben Strop, so S-T-R-O-U-P.com. There's also his LinkedIn, which then will guide you to everything else, which we'll have in the show notes. GetVSS.com. It's the quickest way to get to Velocity Strategy Solutions. Thanks a lot for talking about a, a topic that you know we all intuitively know, but it's good to see someone that's actually walking the talk. So um, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. This has been great. I really appreciate the opportunity. 
great interview with Benny. You can tell his uh, passion. And I just like the way that he thinks a lot more broadly. So you don't necessarily have to go as broad as, as Ben across those four minds. And, but, you know, his principles around adaptive change, the way that you look at the total business and the business outcome. So you, you are, you know, giving people holes, not drills, I think is really important. Just take the bits that apply to you and run that across your business. Cause I know you're not all full fledged consultants. You still do a lot of the technology implementations. That's sort of the key component, but I really like the ability to think broad in that and certainly tap into that strategy component of the four minds. I uh, reach out to Ben on LinkedIn. As he said, he's uh, prolific there. He's got a lot of links to everything and also let him know that you heard him on the show. He will love that. Also share it with other peers that, you know, are trying to look more broadly at, at their business and their service offering. Uh, they'll love you for that. Check out our solo shows, and I'll see you next time on the Paul Higgins Show. Time for action. Subscribe, comment, and let me know what you like best about this episode. Plus, get the Strategic Profits Blueprint at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash blueprint.